Welcome to another episode of Cosmic Echo, a Taylor podcast. In this podcast, we explore the bizarre phenomena that happens in our lives when we sleep in altered states. In this particular episode, we get to speak with James Kent, who is the author of The Pit Theory, otherwise known as the Psychedelic Information Theory. James has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the psychedelic experience and understanding the science behind it. James provides us an alternative view into how the psychedelic experience is actually generated inside our minds. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, we encourage all our listeners to please visit our website at taylors.com backslash CE podcast, and there you can listen to additional episodes as well as join our patron page and support this podcast. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. How are you doing today, James? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, James, uh, before we get started into the pit theory, um, can you give us a little bit of background about your experiences in writing as well as um, your work into psychedelics? Yeah, okay. Well, um, first of all, I've always been, even as a kid, I've always been fascinated by things like uh, optical illusions and uh, how our brain perceives reality and uh, I would do little tricks with my brain, like looking at things with double vision, crossing my eyes, uh, doing long distance staring, and uh, trying to see if I could make reality become something different than what it was supposed to be. And so I think my fascination with psychedelics probably started long before I even knew what they really were. And then at at some point, Right about at my uh, at the age of 20, when I was in college, uh, I got uh, the opportunity to try LSD for the first time, and it kind of triggered in me a lot of these things that I knew about optical illusion and uh, kind of making my brain do tricks like lucid dreaming and that kind of thing, and I became very fascinated with how they worked. And so I got into the scene, I got into the psychedelic scene, and because I was a writer and an editor. I began uh, first as an editor for a magazine called Psychedelic Illuminations in the 90s. And when Psychedelic Illuminations went under, I published my own magazine called Trip Magazine. And then uh, towards the end of Trip is when I started to write Psychedelic Information Theory because I had kind of gone through everything in the uh, popular scene and decided that there wasn't enough kind of scientific material on perception out there. So I wanted to make a contribution and kind of gather up everything that I had learned over the years. Okay. And put up okay. kind of one unified theory of hallucination, and that's where Pip came from. Oh, great. Um, I guess we can get started into, into your Pit um, theory. Um, mm-hmm. So get into Pit. Pit seems to be um, pretty advanced theory with many different types of references and terms that I think – most of the psychedelic community um, may not fully understand. Um, So my goal with this interview is to give you your version of Pitt in such a way that um, hopefully the general um, population can understand it. Um, So with that, um, how did you get the idea of Pitt? Well, it first came to me as a a new way of kind of understanding psychedelic hallucination. I had a kind of come to the conclusion that most of the theory out there focused more on the content that was created uh, as opposed to how that content was created. And my goal was to study the brain to see how by just adding one small molecule, suddenly you can generate all this new information. So the process of generating new information under the influence of psychedelics to me is is the the most important thing to understand. Mm. And the content of psychedelic experimentation is kind of secondary to understanding that first part uh, because the content is subjective for everyone. Mm -hmm. But the process of generating information is the same for everyone. So I think that's what people really want when they take psychedelics. They want to kind of go to that well of imagination where new ideas, novel ideas, novel perspectives pop out. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, and that's I think why people experiment with with psychedelics in the first place. Right. Yeah. It seems like most people want to see um, images and have some type of content from the outside. Is that what you're saying? I think people are kind of when they go into psychedelics. I think they're kind of looking for something. Okay. Um, something that's that's beyond their scope of knowledge, right? Because that's that's mm-hmm. fascinating for people. That's that's kind of a you get a high when you learn something new or when you're when you're confronted with something that's that's confounding. And uh, I think a lot of people really value the creativity that they mm-hmm. get out of psychedelics, and they value the ability to spontaneously change their perspective about themselves or about people they know or the world uh, and kind of create a new identity and uh, that newness that new identity, that new perspective the new ideas, the new art forms, the new writing the new clothing and design, all of that comes out of this experimentation of trying to get the brain to produce novelty beyond normal imagination Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so getting into Pit um, a little bit more, um, can you give us a little brief overview of exactly what the theory is itself? Um, a yeah, okay, so, detail, I guess. so the simplest way to describe it is uh, that the brain and the consciousness and perception exist in uh, many stable states. There's, you know, you could be awake and alert, you can be relaxed and introspective, you can be asleep and dreaming. Mm-hmm. You can be asleep with no sensation. Okay, so there's this, there's a spectrum of consciousness that, that we move from one to another, and it remains really stable. And because it's stable, our perception of reality is hard and seamless. You know, nothing, everything is where it should be. What Pitt says is that all hallucination in the brain no matter whether it's from a chemical or physical trauma or some kind of yogic technique, all hallucination in the brain starts when the pieces of the brain that connect perception start to lose communication with each other. And when the various areas of the brain that handle perception lose communication with each other, there are gaps in the reality that is coming in. And when there are gaps in that reality, the brain automatically starts to fill in the missing details. Now, this is kind of what happens when you're dreaming, is your brain fills in a whole reality to cope with sensations that you're having while you sleep. Okay. And, yeah. uh, and when uh, you take psychedelics, you may be standing awake and alert, but because there's those gaps in your incoming perception, because your brain is kind of decoupling, the various areas of the brain start to amplify and lay over each other, trying to fill in those gaps. And a lot of the same processes involved in dreaming and imaginary recall go into filling those gaps. Hmm. So, the, so the dreaming part of the brain creates a smoothing process over the noise and distortion that's caused by the brain decoupling. Okay. So that is really kind of the central piece of it. And if you can just get that piece, all the other details in Pitt are just explaining how that happens from a pharmacological standpoint, from when the drug hits the receptor, how the different areas of the brain start to lose timing with each other, and what that loss of timing means for how we then parse perception. All right. Um, so, in um, going off from there, um, in your words, what is consciousness uh, made of? Well, consciousness is kind of, I think, a, a term for an aggregate of sensation. To me, uh, you know, consciousness. When when people talk about consciousness, it's almost like they're talking about only one state of consciousness, which is being awake and alert. And to me, there's just a wide spectrum of states that, that the brain can be in uh, that we move through every day. So consciousness is, is, is a process that, uh, 
that moves from being super alert and super engaged in reality to completely detached and, and gone, flattened. Uh, when you go into deep sleep, consciousness pretty much disappears, and all that's left is this, this autonomic biological you know, uh, process that keeps you alive. But, but, but consciousness is gone. It disappears. So, so to me, it's, it's when the brain is up and running, and we've got our memory online, and we've got our perception online, and we're able to behave and interact with reality. I think that's what most people consider consciousness. Mm. And uh, to me, that's only kind of one little tiny piece of it. But I, I don't like to use the word consciousness too much. I, tend to, I like to use words like, like perception or self-awareness okay. uh, because those uh, are a little bit more descriptive than consciousness, which is this kind of – you know, it can go. It's it's a it's a it's a philosophical concept almost. Mm-hmm. It's not really definable. Okay. Um. Yeah. In, in your theory, I was reading about it, and it it just went in um, depth in the consciousness and what it's made up of. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, so there's there's um, perception is really kind of what we think of as consciousness, but there's also memory. There's the ability to recall memories, uh, there's behavior, and there's a feedback between all of these processes. So you don't just behave, you don't just create behaviors out of nothing. They're generated by perception mm-hmm. and how that perception bounces against pattern matching in your memory and recall. Mm. So when perception comes in, you bounce those perceptions against memory and recall, and that triggers behaviors, whether it's an emotional response or a physical response or an internal thought, that's, that's a behavior. Hmm. Then those behaviors bounce back into perception. So you've got perception, input, pattern matching, memory recall, behavior, and then behavior feeds back into perception. So it's, just, it's a very, it's a feedback loop. Okay. okay. So while you're thinking a thought, you don't, you don't lose the thought in mid-sentence because the loop keeps going the thought continues. If you break right. if you break that feedback loop of consciousness, suddenly you lose you lose where you are. You forget where you are. That's kind of what senility is. Is when you start start to lose that feedback loop on where you are and who you are okay. and what okay. you're doing, and you forget. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's kind of what I see consciousness is, is that feedback loop through all those layers of perception and memory and behavior and then looping back in on itself so okay. that you can keep, keep the train going. So it, it pretty much perception, yeah, you touch, you feel, things like that, and then it creates a, a loop kind of in your mind. Is that uh, what you're going at for um, consciousness being like a yeah, constant? Consciousness, consciousness is that feedback loop. And okay. when you lose okay. the feedback loop, consciousness sort of disappears. Self-awareness disappears, and you, all you're left with is kind of raw sensation. Okay, and that is one aspect of psychedelic, uh, you know, experimentation. You can get to a point where the brain, the the modulation in the brain, the serotonin modulation in the brain, uh, is almost cut down entirely. So the feedback loop never actually closes on awareness, and it's just this open-ended raw sensation where there is no time, there is no self, there is no memory. It's just sort of being. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um. Is that something that happens over time, or is it something that happens every time that you um, that you when you take psychedelics? Yeah. Um, well, in, in psychedelic literature, it's called ego loss. Mm-hmm. They call it ego loss, where uh, and it's also kind of a mystical notion. It's in, uh, in Buddhism and a lot of uh, yoga and meditative practices, right. where you want to reach this state where you're where the, the self disappears, and you kind of transcend that idea of being. Um, you know, constantly looped in a goal-oriented behavior, right? And you sort of just let that all slip away, and suddenly you're just immediately in the moment, with no preconceptions. Now that's, even though it's a mystical notion, there's a very biophysical element to the way the brain slips out of that self-referential loop and becomes open-ended like that, mm-hmm. and uh, and that has to do with the uh, the 5-HT system. The way uh, serotonin modulates the forebrain, which is kind of the center of our, our rational self-awareness. Mm. And when psychedelics interrupt the communication to that area, 
because they stick to the same receptors, the serotonin, you get this, you get, like I say, uh, holes. You get uh, a distortion in holes in the self-referential loop. And the brain can either smooth over those holes and try to make wild tangential assumptions about mm-hmm. what's going on, but at deeper layers of that, it just slips all together, and it's like you're in a waking dream. Hmm, okay. Yeah, um, I mean, I I do a lot of lucid dream work and stuff like that and talk with people that do lucid dreams, and it sounds a lot like this happens during um, – the same thing happening during lucid dream states is uh well the it's, loss of it's ego kind of thing it's it's the opposite because the dream starts with the loss of ego right but it only becomes lucid when that self referential loop comes back online hmm. so when you're in a dream your your rational forebrain is shut down because serotonin is no longer modulating the brain hmm. it's being modulated by acetylcholine which slows the brain down into this more dreamlike imaginary maintenance area like a trance like a trance state okay and all of the activity from the brain is coming from the hippocampus and the medial areas of the temporal lobe which are like the emotional centers and the memory centers and uh uh you know memory recall areas Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. in order for you to dream and have that kind of really really robust memory recall and in concrete imaginal rendering you need to shut down the rational forebrain because if the rational forebrain is online, all of that imaginary stuff slips into the background. Mm-hmm. And the brain does that for a reason. It has this switch that you can go back from being awake and present and asleep and dreaming because you don't want to be wandering through life looking around and trying to perceive reality and have your dreams being superimposed on reality while you're walking around. Okay. And psychedelics kind of hang that switch open so you can be awake and superimposing dream images on top of what you're seeing Mm. in dreams the switch from the rational forebrain is completely off but as you begin to wake up the rational forebrain comes online and for a little while there you are lucid in your dream and then when the rational forebrain is fully online you wake up and the dream ends Mm, okay (laughs) So lucid dreaming is, is very similar to psychedelics, but it's starting from the dream and becoming lucid. Psychedelics is being lucid and then tamping that down until the dream element comes forward. Yeah. There's a, I mean, some people do like the wake back, the wake back to bed um, um, technique, which is they're, they're awake and then um, they go back to sleep and then um, they experience like floating, they experience like a loss of self kind of, and then they're in the dream world and then um, they're lucid. So in that sense, um, I could see how that could apply to um, the pit as well. Um, so, well, this is, the, 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 there's a, the hypnagogic state is really, it's yeah. uh, if you look at the brain from the brainwave standpoint, there is a really discrete section uh, between like, three and four hertz, three or four cycles per second, where the brain is hung in that hypnagogic state, that trance state, where you are, it's usually laying down, eyes closed, but you are kind of in a dream. You're in that Mm. trance dream. And you can actually slip down into sleep, which is like three hertz or two hertz or down to zero hertz to deep sleep. But then when you come back up to like four or five hertz, the rational forebrain starts to go into the alpha mode which is kind of the relaxed reverie. And then you begin to wake up. But if you can just sit there and hang in that little tiny frequency range, you can lucid dream, you can be in trance, you can do this kind of body disappearing thing where you appear to float and the body becomes, uh, you know, invisible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, you know, that's kind of the, the, the goal of a lot of yogic meditation is dropping right into that hypnagogic range. Okay. And psychedelics do that great i mean they're 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 just they're almost custom made for for making those trance states happen so hmm. it makes yeah. loose yeah. makes makes achieving things similar to lucid dreaming much easier than just trying to trying to, to hold that state yeah. you know balance yeah. on that state naturally you know you doing it naturally you can make it last for a minute or two maybe five minutes right. but you're always going to wake up you're always going to keep sure, waking, waking up out of it Psychedelics keep you in that state for hours at a time if you're meditating. Mm. You, know, you just stay there and then you just you just hang open in that space as long as you want until the drug starts to wear off. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah, I can totally see um, how that makes sense. Did, um, just a side reference, did did you happen to read any of um, Alan Watts, I th or not Alan Watts, sorry, um, Alan Hobson's... Uh, yeah, the dream drug store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was fairly influential. Uh, as I was starting a uh, writing pit, there were a couple authors who were very influential. Uh, Hobson was one of them. Uh, he's the one who basically defined this chemical switch between mm -hmm. dreaming and waking, which is the acetylcholine serotonin modulation gating uh, that goes back and forth between the hippocampus, the memory, and the rational forebrain, which is perception. And uh, uh, that kind of was the, the first, maybe not the first, but the, this first or second piece that I read that made me think that, oh, okay, there is there is a really easy way to, de to define this. Maybe not easy, but All there right. is a biological way to define what's going on. Uh, Joseph Ledoux's uh, synaptic self and emotional brain really kind of, uh, I had a lot of assumptions about what the brain did but I didn't really know anatomy very well. Mm -hmm. And after reading that book, I was like, okay, and now I understand why, why I think those things. Mm -hmm. uh, learning the anatomy and learning how the emotional centers and the memory centers worked, plus Hobson's work together, led me towards, um, you know, kind of putting together all the pieces on Pitt and how okay. the uh, this imaginal process works. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I read the Dreams Drugstore as well, and that kind of inspired me into um, doing the same thing you kind of did with the. Um, I did a couple of papers on how chemicals interact in the brains, things like that. So I, I yeah, I there's that... there's actually some interesting stuff you can do with Hobson's work. Is that uh, if you if you do take psychedelics specifically for that really kind of explicit eidetic lucid dreaming experience, mm -hmm. you can pre-dose with supplements like choline or galantamine that, that stimulate acetylcholine production hmm. so that when you go into that trance state, you have an amazingly rich experience. And, wow. sometimes, and sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, so rich, it's, just, it's beyond your control. This is like a, it's like a biological reflex that happens, this, wow. dreaming, this dreaming engine. And when you kick that biological reflex into overdrive, you get extremely intense and just rapid fire uh, imagery, photorealistic imagery. Uh, just uh, so, yeah. There's it's it's Hobson's work is more than just a theory. It's testable. You can go in. You can you can freak this gate between perception and dreaming, and uh, and you know it's all legit. I mean, <laughs> the, the science works. Yeah. And if if you just you know pay attention to it, a lot of the way that the brain works in these states becomes more intuitive and obvious. Huh. I never heard of it that, that way before. That's interesting. Um, so, more into, your, into the pit, um, what is the controlled interrupt model and how does it apply to the psychedelic action or what, uh, and, or better, what does that exactly mean? Okay, so the control interrupt model. What, what, so we've been talking a lot about uh, perception and consciousness as this right. feedback loop, and uh, consciousness operating on various frequencies from alpha, beta, uh, theta, delta. Uh, so this this frequency of consciousness from you know let's say we're in a beta state, which is awake and aware. Mm -hmm. This frequency of consciousness is like a control loop. It's it's uh it's like a circuit running it's like electricity running through a circuit, and you can see how fast the electricity is running through the circuit by looking at things like the brainwave speed, like 18 hertz, say okay. 18 cycles per second. That is the control frequency. That frequency is holding consciousness together. It's holding perception together. When multimodal perception comes into the forebrain. It, it all reaches the brain at the same frequency. And because it reaches the brain at the same frequency, reality stays bound. It stays mm -hmm. together. Now, I'm oversimplifying that a little bit. Not yeah. everything <laughs> comes in at the same frequency. But there's enough of an aggregate there between everything coming in at once, keeping it all bound within a reasonable frequency. There's a there's dominant frequencies and subdominant frequencies and brain waves are more complex than I'm than I'm making out right here. Okay. But generally there is a dominant control frequency in in, in the way that we're we're perceiving reality. 
The control interrupt model says that in order for hallucination to begin, you have to interrupt that control frequency. Hmm. Now, the most dramatic way to interrupt it is to knock somebody in the head with a baseball bat. It <laughs> just completely disappears, right? Right. And then they hallucinate stars <laughs> yeah. or bright lights. But there's, very, there's a wide range of subtle methods of interrupting that frequency before you get to that point of knocking it completely out. Hmm. So the control interrupt model says that hallucination begins by interrupting that control frequency. And if you take a drug, drug that has a very subtle interruption on that control frequency that lasts over an eight-hour period, over time that subtle interruption will grow into this huge noise wave hmm. that just cascades over time until you're into this, this, this feedback loop of noise. So that kind of describes the methods by which drugs get into the perceptual system and then kind of hack perception by, by freaking that control loop. And the way they do that is with an interference wave. They create interference in the control loop that keeps everything from, from being synchronized. synchronized. Yeah. When brain areas start to lose synchrony, and there's distortion in the, in, the, in the signal, then the dreaming part of the brain comes on and starts to fill in those gaps. So one of the, one of the ways I like to, one of the metaphors I like to use for this is uh, back in the old days when they were first making moving pictures, films, they would roll a reel to advance the film and a bulb would flicker for each frame. Now, when people watch movies, if they watch them for more than five or ten minutes, this little gap between frames, the gap between flickers, which I'll mm -hmm. call the dead space, people started to hallucinate faces in that dead space, hmm. which was the opposite frequency of the bulb flicker, right? Hmm. You have the bulb flicker on, bulb flicker off. Now, on, they're seeing the movie. Off, they're seeing these hallucinations in the dead space. Weird. Okay, so now... Imagine you take a drug that puts 30 dead spaces in perception for every second. Hmm. So you get this tiny, mild flicker in perception where you have these, these interrupts, these little dead spaces in the update rate of your perception. Mm -hmm. Now, when that happens, the brain starts to do all sorts of stuff to compensate for those little dead spaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the control interrupt is kind of modeling how drugs can interrupt the control frequency on various different frequencies to create different types of hallucination. Okay. And the kind of types of hallucination a drug produces are representative. They're exactly correlated to the frequency that they interrupt consciousness on. So if a drug interrupts consciousness on a lower frequency, it'll produce a different kind of hallucinations than a drug that interrupts consciousness on a higher frequency. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Say so. That's the control interrupt model, and that is uh, something that I came up with and have tested with various different drugs. And uh, even though this is this is just kind of my own model that I I, I cobbled right. together out of pieces, it appears to work for just about everything. Um, you know, mind machines that stimulate the mind with lights and sound mm -hmm. or strobe lights, yeah. they're doing the same kind of thing. They're creating this off and on dead space uh, thing. Now, the difference between a strobe light machine and a drug is that the brain creates the strobing in the neural, I mean, sorry, the drug creates the strobing or the flicker mm -hmm. in the neural network itself. It's not coming in through the retina or the ears. It's, it's being applied directly to the neural network. And that's why you can't shake it off. I mean, you can't open your eyes and make it stop. You can't mm -hmm. close your eyes and make it stop. When you're in that hallucinating state and your, your neural network is being interrupted and flickering like that, it stays in that state until the drug is metabolized. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. Um, so if, a little bit of my reflection of what you just said. So in consciousness is a constant, um, is a constant flow. Um, and yeah, it's a feedback loop. It's more right. like a gate. It flows upwards and then it flows back in. So, right. it's, so it's a yeah, it's a constant feedback. Um, 
and it creates you know normal consciousness and then when you alter that what you're doing is you're creating in a way spaces in between the, the normal flow and then your brain compensates by creating imagery or in those sensations. spaces yeah okay yeah so it goes it goes from a level of a very mild interrupt where you're only getting sort of like stuff appearing in the periphery mm -hmm. to a very hard interrupt where you're starting to get more photorealistic images appearing with your eyes open mm -hmm. to a complete interrupt where you're on your back with your eyes closed and you're completely in this dreaming space. And that would be like considered the that, peak of the drug kind of? Yeah, that would be the peak when the interrupt takes over the control frequency and becomes consciousness. Consciousness becomes the interrupt frequency. Mm -hmm. Psychedelics remodulate the brain to their own interrupt frequency. Hmm. Interesting. And you can kind of shake that off when you're in the peak. If you open up your eyes and you start moving your arms and legs around, the mu rhythm that controls uh, movement of your muscles and your limbs will override that interrupt. Hmm. Will override the interrupt of the drug, and suddenly your your forebrain consciousness will come back online. Hmm because that control frequency has been interrupted. But the minute you sit down and sit still and become quiet again, the control frequency amplifies, feeds back on itself, and suddenly you're in the interrupt and you're not in waking consciousness anymore. Wow. So, yeah, it, it's always in training you towards that dead space. Interesting. Totally makes sense. Um, so... In your book, you talk about um, the pharmac uh, pharmacology of psychedelics and stuff, and you, you described a little bit with uh, acetylcholine and 5-HTP. Um, is there, you know, can you go a little bit more into that, of how psychedelics um, affect that and what they bring to the table? Well, yeah, the, 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 uh, the acetylcholine 5-HT gating really applies to tryptamine psychedelics like uh, LSD, mushrooms, DMT, ayahuasca, any of the tryptamines because those are the ones that most dramatically alter the 5-HT system, the serotonin system, and uh, kind of knock the rational forebrain offline. The other end of the spectrum is the, uh, the anticholinergic drugs like Datura, Belladonna, alkaloids, uh, they produce drug, they produce hallucinations the opposite way by stimulating the acetylcholine response and kind of knocking the rational forebrain down that way. Okay. So you can you can either you can either knock out the rational forebrain or you can amplify the medial temporal lobe. And either way you can kind of freak the way that, that gate switches. Now um, interrupting five H T creates a different sort of hallucination than interrupting the acetylcholine. Uh, doing the acetylcholine, uh, like uh, anticholinergics, creates really dramatic dream states that are completely, you know, disorienting, like more like being in a, in a delusional state, like a waking dream or a lucid dream. And uh, other psychedelics are more like they don't affect the 5-HT system as directly but because they affect the rational forebrain you do get similar effects and because they do affect adrenaline which is a big part of psychedelic experience that a lot of people don't talk about um, they do have psychedelic effect even though they may not be quite as hallucinatory and I'm thinking more of the phenethylamines like uh, 2CB and mescaline in this category they're psychedelic but they're not as hallucinatory and that's because they don't affect the 5-HT system the same way Okay. and there is a target set of receptors that if you want a drug to be super hallucinatory you target it to the 5-HT2A and 5-HT2C receptors as well as the adrenal receptors hmm. and um, that's how you make a really potent tryptamine to get that that uh, that really intense hallucination, and uh, Dave Dave Nichols's research uh, from the with the Hefter Institute. You know who okay. Dave Nichols is? No, I don't. Yeah, Dave Dave Nichols pretty much has done most of the major research on the five HT two A and two C in his lab, the Nichols lab. Mm 
and uh, most of my understanding of how that works comes out of work in his lab. Hmm. And he's he's the real he's the real authority on that. Okay. But um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how. If you if you have a psychedelic that targets the dopamine receptors, mm-hmm. the the psychedelic, the quote unquote psychedelic effect that you'll get will be more sensual, and it'll be more adrenal. It'll it'll you know include adrenaline more. Like there'll be rushes of sensation, hmm. uh, as opposed to being like pure hallucination. But uh, but the control interrupt is still there. You can still feel the buzzing or the vibration or whatever hmm. it is that's going on in your in your body as as it comes on. Okay. So um, you know, this is what I kind of reflect on what you said is pretty much um, different types of drugs affect different types of receptor sites, creating mm-hmm. that type of gate in um, in that experience or in our normal flow of consciousness, and then it interrupts it and it causes us to um, have hallucinations and different types of sensations because of that. Yeah, so really to, to create hallucination, all you need to do is interrupt the, rat, the forebrain uh, enough. And different drugs do that in different ways depending on receptors they target. Like salvia, salvia divinorum and nitrous oxide don't target any of those receptors. But because they interfere with incoming sensation uh, so dramatically, they create their own interrupt frequency and produce their own different types of hallucination, which are very different than tryptamine hallucinations. So the, tr- the hallucinations that you get on mescaline or uh, ayahuasca or something like that. Okay. So um, yeah, different, uh, yeah, so different receptors and different targets will create different types of control frequencies. And based on those control frequencies, those interrupt frequencies, I'm sorry, based on those interrupt <laughs> frequencies, um, that will tell, that will dictate how hallucination is generated and the types of hallucination that you'll get. If you enjoyed this episode of Cosmic Echo, please visit our website at www.taileaters.com backslash CE podcast, where you can hear more episodes that we've produced. Additionally, you can donate to our Patreon page and help support the podcast as we continue forward. Thanks, and until the next episode, happy dreaming.